Um, hi, everybody. Today I will tell you about the relationship uh, between Mercurial and Python. So myself, I'm Pierre-Yves. I'm working on Mercurial for about four years. Uh, I'm working at Facebook. And this talk was o originally prepared with someone called Alexi Metero uh, that worked at Mozilla. Um, so Mercurial is a version control tool. Uh, if you don't know what's a version control tool, you could be using betterfs, but you should probably learn what the version control is. I uh, would not know what version control is here. OK, I, I know you lie. <laughs> um, so Mercurial is written in Python. It's 10 year old. It's uh, very similar to Git, because it's what's created by the same people at the same time for the same reason. So you can basically assume it's, it's Git written in Python with some differences. So why did the guy who did Mercurial in the first place pick Python instead of something else? He was a kernel developer. It's, it's a bit strange. So it's the usual reason. It's really easy to make a proof of concept. It's really easy to support multiple platforms without to write more code for that. It's fast enough to do stuff. Uh, it's, and then it's really easy to make multiple versions of something to try different uh, approach to a problem. So you can have very fast development. Um, a quote that goes like that uh, on this topic is, this is an uh, IRC code. NPM is Matt Michael, the creator of Mercurial. And we have um, users that say, well, yeah, uh, Mercurial is great, but I would like it would be written in C. And Matt Michael reply, eh, if it was written in C, it would have taken me six months instead of two weeks to get a prototype running. And I have 20 years of C behind me. So Python was a great choice to have something. Uh, as a good example of that, in 2005, uh, there was a mini the initial Mercurial announcement. One month later, there was an HTTP server to pull and push. And one month after that, we had Windows support. But before talking too much about Python in Mercurial, as you're all Python developers, I'm going to talk a bit about how having something written in Python can help you users to get something from it. Having something in Python makes it easy to hack, and in the Mercurial case, it's easy to extend. But before talking about how easy to extend it is, I'm also going to just talk a bit about how awesome it is to use Mercurial. So the official API for Mercurial is not in Python. It is the command line, the so thing that, that is very stable and very powerful and can be used from anywhere is our command line API. We also have various uh, bindings, so you can talk to Mercurial using Python, Java, uh, C, C Sharp, stuff like that. Uh, and what they do is they actually talk to Mercurial through the command line to make sure it's stable. So for example, if you want to know something simple like who did the most commit in my project, you can just ask uh, Mercurial to only display the author of every commit and then use your uh, usual bash knowledge and you get the good result. You can also go faster using some magic syntax to select a revision, so you can on already do all the sorting on different stuff to get to get results. Um, the first thing we think we just saw this screen. Is, oh yeah, okay, um, is something called RefSet, where you can select stuff uh, by uh, we using functions. So the first thing get all the the chunk set done by someone done Alexi at Mozilla. You can also get all the chunk set in the last week that touched Python file. And you can actually do much more, uh, like all the stuff that are in the 2.8 release and not in 2.7.3, or um, all the stuff that are <laughs> between two weeks and that fix something and that are not merged. This kind of thing. You can also do subtraction, addition, stuff like that. So we're done with the command line going back one level on the byte and Python. So it's, it's Python's. We have high-level API to do stuff in a very Pythonic way. Um, this code is almost working. I just had to remove four imports at the beginning. Um, you just have to create a repo. And then from this repo, you can just get the transit iterating on it. You have the thing, and 
you have the same thing that, that we did with the command line when, but with, with the Python scripts. You can turn that in an extension by just adding the few things at the beginning, and then you have a new ag stat command that does the same thing. Uh, you don't have to do that because we already have it, but it's a good example of how easy it is to extend Mercurial uh, in Python. It may seem kind of useless, but actually most of the big company we move from something to Mercurial always have some kind of crazy workflow or some tools they want to integrate with, and you can write 30 lines of Python in a file and magic, the version control system is integrated with something else. And actually right now the Python people are writing a small extension to uh, fetch and upload patch from the bug tracker to the version control system. Um, of course, also eating Python gets you more performance, and so the command line version is about twice slower than the Python version because we have bullet points all, all around the way to get that. The timing is probably a bit wrong too, but. So let's stop talking about MQL and go back about Python. Python. Because you know Python is a language that is slow, right? You can't write anything serious with Python, of course. Well, actually, the most important thing is your algorithm. If you have stupid algorithm, you could write them in assembly. It's going to keep being stupid. So without changing language or anything, we got like 10x improvement from just changing the way we add and remove file when you have did a lot of change and you want to just record them. Um, we get um, 40x improvement by just using dedicated data structure to store all the hash for transit instead of, of basic dictionary and stuff like that. So focus first on your algorithm, and then maybe you will have to use a different language. Um, talking about data structure, it's really important to get stuff right, to get something running. The way stuff are organized in Mercurial is in multiple files. The first and most important files, maybe, is uh, the change log. The change log con contains all the change set data. The change sets are who did a commit, why he did it, when he did it, on what other commits uh, this change set is based on, and so it's also core information for commits. There is a second file called um, manifest that contains um, the list of every file and their version, and their version for every version of that manifest. So the, the change set is saying, okay, someone did some change, and that change contained the, that manifest. And there is another set of files that contains the actual revision of every file, which means that as we have different files for everything, if you need information about the change set, you can just ask the change log. If you need information about what change at high level between two change sets, you only have to get the manifest. And if you want to like run blame or you have the log of a specific file, you only need to accept that specific file where all the information will be. Each of these files is uh, something called a revlog that is a mix of full snapshot and binary diff. When you first add a file, you get the full snapshot of that file because you have no information about whatsoever about, how, what, about that file. So you get the full snapshot of that, and from there, you, uh, when you have a new version of the file coming, you make a binary diff to only store stuff that change between the first version and the second version. And you keep going like that until the amount of diff you have is start to get big. And actually, it's, it's going to get bigger to read all the deltas and a diff between um, the new one you're going to add and the full snapshot you have than actually storing a new full snapshot. And so you, you, full, you store new full snap, snapshot. This is similar to what video encoding is doing, where you have full image and then delta against it, and then a full image again, and everything. This means that you have something which is efficient in space, because you mostly store diff, but that is still good in access time, because you don't have to apply thousands of diff to get anywhere. The, something good from having this format, where you keep adding stuff at the end, it's, it's up and only which means that it's very easy to do the transaction. You write stuff at the end. If the, if the transaction is aborted, you remove everything that you added at the end. Um, 
but it also means that you have some constraint, like getting file content, it's, it's much, you have, you have a direction where stuff are easier to read than, than, than the other one. So we talk about Python and how data structure are important, but we're going back to uh, another adventure of Python, being able to use C while you actually write stuff. Because C is much more efficient for multiple kind of things. So in Python, we have about 5% um, of uh, of or about five percent of the MySQL code is in C. It's used for all the low-level uh, operation, like reading the disk, writing to the disk, um, starting all the directory to find what changed, these kind of things, uh, computing diffs, uh, applying diff to to a, to a file, all the data structures that are very heavily used, like indexes for for hash and these kind of things. And also most of the common graph algorithm, like looking all the children of something, looking at the, uh, what are merged and this kind of thing that are, go much faster in, in C because they are just looking at big array with, with in, integrating them. Um, but we have a big Python thing that can be properly organized with object and clean API. So all the C part are just a small bit that is implemented both in Python for compatibility and readability, and have a C, a C version that do one thing and just one thing, and so the craziness of C can be easily contained. So Python is great, but sometimes it's not that great. So you have to know what the downside are and what the constraints you're going to have and when not to use it too much. So function calls are slow. It's about 60 nanoseconds going to, to make a call, a function call. It's not much, but if you have like a repository with one million chantets, which is about what Facebook have, this means that you're going to spend 60 milliseconds every time you add a function call in something that goes through every chantet, if you ever have that. And then that's, that's pretty expensive for just one function call. So you're going to refact to, to be more, you're going to use function less, you have, you're going to have more code duplication at some point because you cannot, they're not going to be in line, so you cannot use them everywhere. In the same way, object creation are slow. In the example we saw before, we had something that gets the username reading, creating a transit object, and actually, uh, if you don't create the object at all and you just read the data from the, the raw data structures, uh, it's going much faster because creating object and everything is also slow in Python. So again, if you have a code that are going to run a lot, you cannot really use object in it, or you have to be careful about what you do. Um, you don't have multiple, good multiple support because of the GIL, so if you really want to do multiple, to use all your CPU, you either have to write the really hardcore C code, or to do forks and then communicate between your forks, which means that you're going to do that less because it's kind of complicated and, and expensive to do. And on some platform like Windows, where starting a thread is taking a few 10 seconds, it's, um, it's not an option for most operation. It's also slow to start compared to about every other programming language, but Python 3. Um, so if you compare to that, we're doing pretty bad. And addition, in addition to that, something that was already told in the previous talk is imports are super slow because it's going to look at every single, like multiple time in every single directory of that stuff. So just importing um, some specific directory is going to take maybe, uh, some specific module can take up to a second, and I'm not kidding here. So we have a lazy import system that when you import a module, you don't actually import it. And the first time you try to use it, it's the time when you're going to import it. So we can have a full complicated import tree for every command we need. But unless you actually need that module for that very command, you're not going to use it. And so it allows us to shave off about um, half or the basic invocation of Mercurial. But we are still 60 milliseconds to just print the version, which is basically doing nothing but reading a string and putting in a standard output. Um, stuff like setup tools and eggs used to make the syspass terrible. It's got much better in, in, since uh, the recent effort in the Python packaging. 
So garbage collection is slow too, uh, and, and if you have something that creates a lot of objects and then do play with them, even if it's uh, and um, very basic type, it's going to trigger the garbage collector and can have significant impact. It doesn't seem too much, but if your command is about to run in, in a quarter of a second, it, it's a lot, a big impact. And something which is less about performance is typing, and it's uh, eventually going to be solved since you went at Python. Um, Mercurial is pretty good code base, but it's still 10 year old, and there is stuff a bit in every direction. And sometimes when you do refactoring, you may have a good test suite that's going to catch mostly everything, but you're still not, you're not too sure about what is this C variable about, what is this L variable about, and having actual type checking and type annotation would be great. So in conclusion, Python is really great. As look as you don't want to call function, don't want to create objects, don't want, don't have multi-core hardware, don't write command line tools, which is more common, and don't need garbage collection. So this this is a bit trolling slide, of course. Uh, this means that you can't can't really do that in any very intensive part of your Python application. Um, you can, it's really great to have Python for all the glue around Mercurial, all the, the logic of what the command do and how they interact with each other, but all the core logic that actually need to read data and, and do computation on them uh, is, is really limited. Is, you have to use a more limited set of Python. So how are the other DVCs doing? When we wrote that time, Bazaar was just dead. Uh, now I don't know who still know what Bazaar is, but it was it has good idea in it. Uh, there is two in interesting stuff uh, that killed Bazaar. There is a full talk about um, a postmortem analysis of why Bazaar didn't work well, and I, it's really interesting. But two things are interesting here. Uh, they, they didn't have a very good format on the first try, and still didn't add a very good format on the second try. And so it, it took them some time before converging to something that, that was performant enough um, to, to reach the same performance that Mercurial. Uh, so uh, Mercurial had, had good performance from the format at the beginning, and Bazaar had trouble with that. Second thing they did is they had an in official internal API in Python. So they expose much more than us in, 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 the, in the API. And so refactoring and changing big, con big concept was much harder than uh, in Mercurial, where the only official API you have is a command line. And so changing big stuff, they had to keep strange concepts around and, and stuff that keeps them slow and didn't like, slow them down in their in the work. Um, there is another DVCS written in C that is quite successful. Um, because it's written in C, it's much faster to do a lot of things that, um, that, are, very, that are very short because it doesn't have the startup time, it doesn't have the import time, and it doesn't have any override on stuff. So like exporting a patch, which is Git show, is very, very fast. Um, the first result of, of Git log is much faster to come than the first result of AG log, status is going to be snappier too. So there is all this stuff, kind of things, but there is all the stuff that doesn't rely on the format either, uh, on the language either, like the format. So we are about similar in size. Um, the time to get a diff can be much faster in Mercurial because, or not much faster, the same in Mercurial because we have uh, a better like a more isolated data structure, so we get the results uh, as fast as Git does, and then it's, it, you just have to read from disk and it's going to be your bottleneck. Um, stuff like rebase that are also very format intensive, uh, and it's even a bit slower on stuff like clone, pull, and update. Update is mostly because we use multicore there, uh, but clone and pull, it's also because of the way the format works and stuff like that. Uh, on stupidly huge repo, like my employer do, um, it's, Mercurial is also much, much faster because as it's very extensive, it's, um, it's very easy to change the stuff that doesn't scale at, at massively huge scale. So we have stuff like Watchman that takes the whole logic that look at the disk to see uh, what files changed to just as the kernel to do that job for us and it, 
it offers the same Python API than the old object used to do, and it should just get there and give you results uh, in, in a second for a few hundred thousand files without any issue. Uh, we can change uh, like the compression, the algorithm used use for compression to have something that is less space efficient but more speed efficient. Um, we can also change core concept like when you pull, you don't actually get all the file history because you don't care about most of the file history because people did 3,000 chances uh, in the, um, since your last work and you're not going to to need all this intermediate version. You're just going to get all the metadata, like the chunk set and the manifest, and you're going to get the file content on demand if you need to. Um, and on the server side, you can do stuff like intercepting every write to the repo to build a journal of that, and then use a SQL database to synchronize all the multiple uh, servers, so you, you have multiple master that are always up to date compared to each other, and you you have multiple uh, servers that are writable, which means you're much you're scaling much better because more people can be pulling at the same time, and also if something fails, you're still running. That's it. <laughs>